talking about the epinephrine, the cyclic AMP. Uh, the effects of epinephrine on the cell. Epinephrine is polar, so epinephrine cannot get into a cell. It has to use a carrier. It has to use a secondary protein. Here, you have the beta uh, andro androgenic and, uh, effect of epron. You do the cyclic adenylate cyclase, CAMP, it activates the protein kinase. Uh, the protein kinase do, uh, what does the kinase do? Phosphorylates. Now this is what kind of what we were talking about in getting ready for for the next exam, which will be chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. I'm not going to do 12. 7 through 11. And I've already got 150 questions, so I'm going to narrow them down. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> well, be sure to grab it before you go home. Okay, thank you. And by that time, I can use your other one. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Okay, so you have two systems. You have the beta androgenic, we'll use a CAMP. You have the alpha androgenic that uses calcium as a secondary messenger. Epinephrine, it's getting into the glucose. It's uh, here, it's taking glycogen to glucose 1-phosphate, to glucose 6-phosphate, to glu free glucose. What's happening here? So you said in this intro you said the calcium ion? In this, for the alpha site, yes, it's calcium. The secondary messenger is calcium. For the beta site, the secondary messenger is cyclic AMP. What, you, where does your epinephrine come from? Adrenal medulla. As part of what system? Now this is kind of how I'm going to write the test. Because we've talked about this from several different angles. And what I'm trying to do is get, get an idea that you guys are kind of being able to put the whole system together. So you have, you have two types of nervous uh, peripheral. You, uh, on the autonomic, autonomic nervous system, you have the Sympathetic and uh, parasympathetic. Okay, good. Sympathetic is associated with the epirep, fight or flight. Parasympathetic is rest or recuperation. With the sympathetic system, the when it fires, because of the axons and the ganglion, when the sympathetic system fires, everything fires. You don't have really kind of a partial system uh, firing for the sympathetic system, partial firing. Now, when that joker jumps out of the alley and scares you, it's not just your blood glucose that's going to rise. Every, I mean, the whole system shoots. That's your, parasymp your sympathetic system. Your parasympathetic uh, can be more great. But your sympathetic system, one of the actions is to release a whole lot of epinephrine and norepinephrine. It dilates through pupils. It it, uh, it dilates the blood vessels to the heart, to the brain. It constricts the blood vessels to the kidney, to the capillary beds and the skin. You ever get that cold, clammy feeling? But up. Your sympathetic system is fight or flight. You want the glucose available for the muscles, you want the, the eyes to be dilated, you want to see as much as you can, get as much light in as you can, you want the heart to have all the blood and the glucose to beat and do its job, skeletal muscles will get glucose because they're going to either run or fight. Anyway, getting back to this, Epinephrine is released. Epinephrine goes to the liver. Epinephrine causes the liver to release glucose into the bloodstream. 
Epinephrine binds at the beta site or the alpha site. The alpha site uses calcium as a secondary messenger. The beta site uses a cyclic AMP. That was a long way around to get to that, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. But you got a whole review of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rudy, what? what did you? Uh, I was going to say, so is that breaking down by the glycogenolysis? Yes. Yeah. Glycogenolysis. Lysis, excuse me. Okay, now insulin uh, uses a tyrosine kinase system. <coughs> The ligon on the outside of the cell, again, insulin can't get through. The ligon receptor on the, is the enzyme tyrosine kinase. Binding site is on the outside of the cell. Enzyme base is the cytoplasm. Enzyme portion is activated via phosphorylation. What would phosphorylate? Kinase. Kinase. Kinase, yes. <laughs> if you're from Canada, you can get away with that. <laughs> what does the term ligand mean? What does that mean? Ligand is, uh, it, it's essentially a chemical that would bind. It's ligand. the chemical that's coming ligand. across. It's simply called a ligand. <laughs> it's a chemical molecule. So, here, the tyrosine kinase system. Activates the receptor, phosphorylates insulin. Uh, so here you have the insulin. You have the beta, the alpha receptor, beta cell. In the cytoplasm, you have an insulin receptor that, that reacts. It takes an ATP to ADP, which it's dephosphorylating the ATP. It's getting ADP plus phosphorus. Okay, phosphorus, in this year, phosphorylating, uh, the receptor, it needs energy. The tyrosine kinase is now active. It uh, phosphorylates the signal molecules inside the, uh, the cell, cascade effects, and glucose uptake. What happens, let me see if it shows you. No, this happens where? This is in the cell membrane. Thank you. What happens with this is you have, remember the GLUT4 proteins? Oh, the GLUT4. I'm sure we've discussed it at least a half a dozen times. Uh, I know I've mentioned it, but let's go back. Remember when we talked about the cell membrane, and this again is what I'm talking about, about starting to put all this stuff together. When we talked about the cell membrane, we told you that all those receptors are not evenly spread out uh, over the cell membrane. I mean, why would you have a receptor for cholinesterase in the postsynaptic membrane, not cholinesterase, acetylcholine in the postsynaptic membrane down where it isn't anywhere near the synapse? You know, they're clustered. And that the cell membrane has the ability to put receptors in when they're needed. So what happens here? is the glucose uptake and anabolic cascade effects, uh, the phosphorylation of signal molecules. What happens here is the signal molecules tell the GLUT4 proteins to get their butts up to the membrane. They get up to the membrane and they allow insulin in. That's how insulin gets into the cell. It's blocked until the phosphorylation takes place the GLUT4 membrane proteins get into the membrane, move literally from the cytoplasm, get inserted in the membrane, they open up the membrane for glucose to come into the cell. Okay? So GLUT4, that's the protein. So it's, again, it's cascade activity. Now, if I had... Uh, and like I said, most, most of these activities are antagonists. What would be, uh, well, actually, never mind. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay, pituitary gland. And uh, so the pituitary gland, it's attached to the hypothalamus by the infundibulum. 
You have the anterior lobe and you have the posterior lobe. And uh, you have a little, uh, you have the adenohypothesis and the neurohypothesis and the interohypothesis, which is in children, but it's pretty much uh, inert in an adult. So here, optic chiasm, here's your hypothalamus, this is your pituitary hanging down. You have the anterior lobe, uh, pars tuberalis, pars distalis, pars intermedia. Uh, that's the intermediate one in the fetus, in the adult. Uh, it's, it's just kind of a band, it's, it's not, not uh, active anymore. Infundibulum is where it attaches, the posterior lobe here. So but the pituitary, uh, this in the book, I don't know where, where this guy lives, but he says the pituitary is about 1.5 centimeters, and it's the size of a pea. Well, I have never seen a pea that's 1.5 centimeters. I mean, that's a bean. Uh, anyway, it's about the size of a kidney bean, something like that. Now, the pituitary gland excretes eight different hormones, and we'll get into that. Okay, pituitary hormones, these are secreted by the anterior lobe, these are secreted by this lobe, here. Trophic hormones. Trophic hormones stimulate hormone secretion in other glands. Growth hormone. Growth hormone works on the testes, the ovaries, the sex organs. Thyroid stimulating hormone works on the thyroid. Actually, I can, this is in your book. ACTH works on the adrenal cortex for uh, secretion of glucocorticoids. TSH on the thyroid gland, growth hormone. Growth hormone works on most tissues, especially uh, one, it's more active at night. Two, it's uh, more active after a, a, meal, a meal with a lot of amino acids. As the cell's picking up the amino acids, uh, the growth hormone help, helps pick them up into the cells and uh, make proteins in that for growing. And it kind of stores them at night, and at night it was really kind of it kicks in. Uh, FSH works on the gonads, works on the sex organs, follicle stimulating hormone, gamete production, uh, estrogen production, uh, prolactin, prolactin primarily, what you really know it for is production of milk in lactation. In the men, uh, it works with the regulation of uh, sodium potassium regulation in the urine. Luteinizing hormone, again, it's a sex hormone. Uh, its target tissue is a gonad, gonads, a sex organ, stimulates sex hormone, other sex hormone secretion, ovulation. Uh, you get a big shot of uh, LH right in the middle of the woman's period, which causes the, uh, the release of the ovum, it causes the formation of the corpus luteum, um, and it stimulates the, uh, from the Leydig cells of the male, it stimulates testosterone production. So here, coming out of the anterior pituitary, you have prolactin, you have growth hormone, you have thyroid, you have ACTH, you have SH, FSH and LH. So you've got six hormones coming out of this, you know, that size of that size of the pituitary would be about the size of the P. Posterior pituitary. Doesn't really produce hormones, it stores them. It stores them and releases them. The pituitary, the posterior pituitary hormones are oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. It stores them and then it releases them. The hormones are made in the hypothalamus. 
hypothalamic control of the posterior pituitary. ADH and oxytocin are produced in the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus. They're transported along the axons of the hypothalamal hypophyseal tract of the posterior pituitary. We go back here. Your hypothalamal hypophyseal tract comes up and down through the endipendibulum. It's released by the neuroendocrine reflexes. It's, so it is released, you know, nerves are allow, allow this to release. In your anterior pituitary, they're released by hormonal. There's no nerve, it's not innervated. The anterior, anterior pituitary is, uh, uh, it reacts to a hormonal regulation, not a neural regulation. Hypothalamic control of the top posterior pituitary, again, what you see here is you have uh, uh, neural regulation. Now, hypothalamic control of the anterior pituitary, like I said, is hormonal, it's not neural. So what you're going to, what is formed here is what they call uh, hypothalamal hypophyseal portal system. What's a portal system? We talked about a portal system way earlier when we talked about the liver. In the anatomy, you heard about the hepatic portal system. Well, a portal system is where veins actually feed veins, as opposed to arteries feeding veins. That's a portal system. So in the liver, you have the veins that are coming uh, from along the intestines. They're picking up the sugar, nutrients, amino acids, and they're feeding it into the liver. So you've got a venous system feeding another venous system, as opposed to an arterial system. That like in the capillary beds, where it's arterial down to the capillaries, and then it's venous from the capillaries back through the venous system, vena cava, and back to the heart, and then to the lungs, and back to the heart, and then back out again. Got that? So a portal is system is a venous feeding a venous, as opposed to an arterial feeding a venous. So, in the, like I said, for the liver, it goes to the kidneys, and that's venous blood. It's picked up, but it's picked up nutrients from, I'm sorry, the intestines, not the kidneys. It's picked up the nutrients, and then takes, shuttles them essentially to the liver. Here, the hypophyseal, hypothalamal hypophyseal portal system picks up the hormones from the, anterior, from the hypothalamus, shuttles them down to the anterior pituitary and then causes the anterior pituitary to release its hormones. Okay, now these are the hormones that are coming out of the hypothalamus. Corticotropin-releasing hormones, CRH. Gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Prolactin-inhibiting hormone. Somatostatin, uh, which again works on the growth hormone. Uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone. Excuse me. So what we just the, the one the hormones we just said that's what come out of the anterior pituitary. Okay. And these come out of the hypothalamus okay. to control the hormones that come out of the anterior pituitary. Okay. So like your thyrotropin releasing hormone that comes down into the anterior pituitary causes the anterior pituitary to release TSH which goes down to the thyroid gland and causes the thyroid gland, gland to release uh, T3 and T4, thyroxine. Okay, so released from the hypothalamus, the hormones that come out of the anterior pituitary. Yes. And here, you have this in your book, hypothalamic hormones in control of the anterior pituitary. So you've got it all right here in a chart, 11.7 uh, in the book. So your cortical releasing CRH stimulates the AD ACTH, which goes down and stimulates the adrenal cortical. 
to, to release one of the three different types of corticosteroids. The GnRH, gonadotropin releasing, stimulates the secretion of SSH and LH. Prolactin inhibiting, it's a dopamine type structure, it inhibits prolactin secretion. Somatostatin uh, inhibits the growth hormone. TRH uh, stimulates secretion of TSH and growth hormone releasing. GHRH stimulates the growth hormone secretion. This is a lot of details. <laughs> this is a physiology class. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just it's a, uh, you know, we will we will talk about the major ones, but the idea is that you know that. I've only got 10 or 12 questions on the chapter, on the test. So I'm, what, I, you know, what I really want to know is, see, is that you know that the hypothalamus is going to control the anterior pituitary, which is going to send out hormones to act all over the body. Now, these hormones are endocrine, exocrine, what are they? Endocrine, they're released into the blood. What uh, what makes them work on a cell? What makes them work on their target organ? Why doesn't why doesn't a thyroid hormone go down to my big toe and cause the muscle to twitch? Because there's no receptor cells. If a hormone is going to work, it's got to have a receptor cell. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay? This is the kind of things that you need to look at because it's putting, we're starting to put the systems together. And this is what we're going to do for the rest of the semester for the different systems. Okay. So in some ways, on, you know, on this test, like the gonadotropin releasing hormones, we're going to get into in detail when we get into the sex organs and reproduction. You know, the cardiac, the thyroid is kind of here, the cardiac hormones when we get into the cardiac. Okay. Okay. Feedback for the anterior pituitary. They're generally regulated by negative feedback again. Negative feedback inhibition. Now it's a little bit different because, I'm going to go back here. Say we look at uh, thyrotropin. Thyrotropin is negative feedback because there is thyroxin in the blood. So it tells it uh, not to, you know, to kind of cut back on what it sends to the anterior pituitary to release TSH. But there's also some short feedback system. So like in this case, TSH, a high volume of TSH, a lot of TSH will actually uh, cause this to be inhibited also cause the thyrotropin releasing hormone, TRH, to be inhibited. So it has two mechanisms of inhibition, a thyroxin from the thyroid gland or a lot of TSH. Inhibition can, can, uh, can occur at the pituitary gland or at the hypothalamic. So when you have a lot of thyroxin, it goes back to the pituitary and inhibits the release of TSH. Or it goes back, and it can go back to the hypothalamus and, re and inhibit the release of the TRH. It's still, you know, don't make it harder than it is, it's still a negative feedback inhibition. That's the, the bottom line, is you're still using a negative feedback inhibition. Okay, here it is. You have the hypothalamus. You have TRH. Goes to the anterior pituitary. Releases TSH. Releases thyroxin. Thyroxin goes back. Inhibits the responsiveness of the anterior pituitary to TRH. Inhibits the secretion of TRH. Okay? Negative feedback. But it's not only acting on the anterior pituitary it's acting on the hypothalamus. Now the short mechanism also is that TSH can go back and inhibit the TRH. It doesn't show it on here. Okay.
Okay, here, uh, this is uh, GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Hypothalamus, gonadotropin releasing hormone, anterior pituitary. FSHLH on the gonads. You have the sex hormones, the estrogens from the women, the androgens, the testosterone from the men. Inhibits the anterior pituitary, also goes back, negative feedback up to the hypothalamus. You have two methods of inhibition. It gives you a much finer control. And this is in the book. Higher brain functions. Hypothalamus receives input from higher brain uh, regions, hormone, alter hormone secretion, the amygdala, various emotions uh, work on the hypothalamus. Six brain regions and olfactory neurons sends axon, axons, the GHRH producing neurons, uh, growth hormone releasing, cortic corticotropin production, stress, when you're stressed, your cortisol goes up. It's one of your body's ways of fighting the stress, bringing the body back to normal. Uh, but it also, uh, let me see if this goes into it. Hang on a second. Who called for it? Now, another thing that happens here, I'm sorry, I'm going to do that. Uh, it talks about six brains, regions, and olfactory neurons and axons. Uh, stressors increase the cortical. Uh, this is where you start looking at uh, your pheromones. The, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've all heard of aromatherapy, you know, to calm people down. Um, there's a thing they call the dormitory effect. Uh, I don't know about the dormitory, but I, I know that each of my brothers has all daughters. And when one menstrual cycle starts, they all start. Uh, what they find is in a woman's dormitory that after uh, a couple of periods that most of the, if you're rooming with somebody, that your menstrual periods tend to start at the same time. This is all, and it doesn't happen if they, and I don't know how they kept somebody's nose plugged with cotton for a month or more, but uh, it doesn't happen if the sense of smell is not there. It's a pheromone. It's a, it's a chemical reaction. I mean, the pheromones are, uh, you know, they are sexually activating uh, more, I mean, it's more obviously in dogs, or at least we will admit it that way when a dog goes into heat. Uh, but it happens in humans also. So it's, you know, we're, we're all mammals, and it, it's something that, that is common throughout the mammals. Okay, adrenal glands. They're found atop the kidney. Add renal. On top, added to the renal, added, added to the kidney, added to the top. Two different mechanisms of formation. You have the cortex, and you have the medulla. Very, the medulla is a nervous. It's from the ectoderm, I believe. I'll, get, I'll probably get it backwards. And the medulla is from the cortex is from the mesoderm. One is more epithelial. One is more nervous. The cortex has three layers, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. They produce three different types of hormones. The adrenal medulla produces what? 
epinephrine and norepinephrine. That's what it does. And it's uh, innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. Adrenal medulla secretes epinephrine, norepinephrine in response to neural stimulation from the hypothalamus. The cortex secretes uh, steroid hormones in response to the ACTH. Steroid hormones are based on what's your basic molecule that forms steroid hormones? Cholesterol. Five carbon ring of cholesterol. Made from cholesterol. You have the mineral corticoids. They work on the kidney. Reabsorption of sodium potassium. Aldosterone. It is really weird when you see somebody come in with an aldosterone secreting tumor. They are so rare. I've seen two, maybe three in 34 years. But these are really sick people because what happens is the aldosterone causes potassium to be secreted so that sodium can be reabsorbed. So these people come in, they will have sodium that will be 150, I'm sorry, 160, 170. They'll have potassium you know, down around 1.5 or 2. Lethal levels at both ends. And, uh, you know, and the doctor's got to be looking, you know, very carefully or thinking about what he's looking at to pick up an aldosterone secreting tumor. Glucocorticoids uh, regulate the glucose metabolism. And then the sex steroids, the weak androgens. Most of your sex steroids come out of the gonads, but your adrenal cortex uh, will produce a few. Glucocorticoid hormones are steroid hormones that influence nutrient metabolism. These hormones activate genes or proteins involved in processes such as the synthesis of glucose, the breakdown of proteins, and the mobilization of fat. Glucocorticoid hormones are secreted by endocrine glands into the bloodstream. They enter cells through transporters in the plasma membrane. Once inside the cytosol, the hormone molecules can bind to glucocorticoid receptors, which function as transcription factors that activate genes. The binding of the hormone causes proteins that will bound to the receptors, such as the heat shock protein HSP90, to be released. Release of HSP90 allows two receptors to bind and form a dimer, as well as exposing a nuclear localization signal on the receptor. The receptor dimer is then allowed to enter into the nucleus through a nuclear pore. The receptor dimer is able to bind to specific DNA sequence regions called glucocorticoid response elements, or GREs, that are near target genes. The GREs function as enhancers, so that binding of a receptor dimer to a GRE activates transcription of the nearby target gene. Okay. What's that? You want, me, you want to repeat it? What are GREs? GRE? A group, uh, glucose releasing enzyme. But look at this. These are the same. So what kind of dimer is that? Homodimer. Homodimer. As opposed to something like thyroid that has two different dimers that go into the nucleus as part of this protein. They're called heterodimers. Now this is something again that's common in hormonal action. Okay, you've got three regions of the adrenal cortex. Like I said, glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. Mineral corticoids come out of the glomerulosa, excuse me, Fasciculata and reticularis, you get your glucocorticoids and your steroids, sex steroids. <clears throat> Adrenal medulla, I think we've talked about this many times. 
So you've got uh, from the sympathetic nervous system, lasts ten times longer. It's secreted in the blood. It lasts ten times longer. It lasts a lot longer. The response to it is slower, but it lasts longer. Cardiac output, respiratory rate, mental alertness, dilate coronary blood vessels, elevated metabolic rates, dilate the pupils. You're getting ready for your fight or flight syndrome again. I see you brought your note taker. <laughs> okay. Adrenal medulla, epinephrine, norepinephrine, that's all it secretes. Stress. Adrenal corticotropic hormone results in the glutocorticoid release, general adaptation syndrome. What they found, and this is in your book, is uh, this Canadian physiologist and masochist uh, took rats and he, in, he injected them with things that caused them to stress. One of the things was from formaldehyde. Oh. Or he would put them in cold water and make them swim until they were exhausted. And he found that at first he thought it was a chemical reaction, but then he found that the stress uh, caused all these hormones to be released, especially the glucocorticoid hormones. And the general adaptation theory essentially states that when you have a traumatic situation, your body tries to come back to a normal, stable level. And it tries to inhibit some of the things that are, gonna, that are going to stress it or make this uh, more difficult. For instance, in trauma, severe infection, and this is something, you know, it's, it's, uh, it talks about it in your book, and your book is fairly, your book is new. I had this discussion which, with a, a doctor that I would consider extremely brilliant. I mean, you know, I had no idea where his IQ was. But this discussion was 30 years ago. And he said, you've got somebody on prednisone, which is because it competes with the adrenal, and they get sick. At that point, general medical wisdom was, you cut out the steroids, you cut out the steroids so that their body immune system can kick back in. Well, what they found out is the people died before their body immune system could kick back in. And so the thinking today is if you're like that, instead of cutting out the steroids and waiting for the body's system to kick back in, you give them more steroids. A few years ago, the, the thinking really changed in you know, for cortisol, which is one of your main glucocorticoids, steroid, or corticoid, cortisol. And you get patients, uh, septic patients, trauma patients in the ICU, intensive care, and the doctors immediately want to get the cortisol checked because if they are low for some reason, they're going to inject them with cortisol. And they're going to bring these steroids up. It helps. Uh, Keep the inflammation down, uh, which allows the body, keeps the body from damaging itself even more. And uh, generally, it's uh, for septic patients and that uh, they feel that it's it's a good thing. Now, I talked to a to a hospitalist today about this, and he I, and I'll I'll get into it a little bit more. But he said, yeah, if you've got somebody that's on prednisone or something like that, you're going to have to give them cortical, give them steroids uh, until, until they get over this crisis. Now, what's, what I find very interesting is working in Mexico, dealing with doctors, you know, 100, 200 miles below the border. When they got a real sick patient like that, Everybody, everybody got a shot of steroids. Uh, and up until a few years ago up here, 
all the doctors up here said, you know, and now, now it's exactly what we're doing up here. So it's. Uh, Did they give him something else in addition to the steroids? I don't know. Like antibiotics? Well, I mean, yeah, obviously there's the antibiotics in that, but they also want to make sure the body uh, is not overwhelmed by simply the stress of the infection. Is it cortisol also the, the stress hormone that helps store stomach fat? Yeah, it help, it, it's got a lot of negative sides to it, but it, uh, you know, at, at that point you're, you're worried more about keeping the stress down. But yeah, it helps you know store fat, but it, well, I just know it's really not good. It's, like, it's, it's not. It's, I mean, yeah, any, being on any big, big steroid is not good for you. I mean, you look at somebody that, you know, with arthritis on prednisone, and that's all we used to give them. And now, now they're on all a bunch of different drugs. But, you know, so would you have to be on some, just some of them? Just some of them, some of them, but, you know, now they're using methotrexate, low doses of methotrexate and that, but, you know, that's nasty again. I mean, you're, you're just trying to balance what, what's going to make you, you know, fight, fight the disease versus kill you. And I think that's what they have been talking about. Prednisone? For? Um, his ulcerative colitis. Yep. Yeah, he would be on prednisone for that. And so if he gets really sick, they're going to have to watch. You know, they're going to have to do some levels and see if he, if he was to become septic for some reason. Well, he's been taking for, I think, two weeks now, and he's been getting um, fluid buildup in his retina. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, you know, fluid retention with a corticosteroid, and you don't even have to take it orally. I am super allergic to poison oak. I got that. I yeah. have to do the whole thing. Yeah, it's and oral steroid, topical steroid. Yeah, and you know, one of my sons doesn't get it. One of them gets it just as bad as I do. And uh, you know, I, I being being you know as compliant as I always am with medicine, uh, wouldn't go to a doctor if my life depended on it. So I just buy the tubes of cortisone, and I would just you know when you when you get cortisone, you're supposed to essentially rub it on as thin as you possibly can. Because it doesn't do any good to put it on thick. I mean, it only works so much. But I was putting it on thick until I had fluid retention, not from taking it and so on, but just putting so much of it on my skin. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say that, can't you also be immune to poison Some people are. One of my sons is. He never gets it. Yeah. But it'll, it'll damn near kill me if I got it bad. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, younger, I would. You know, I'd be out hunting, and then I'd go play tennis, and then I'd come back and pick up the dog, and then I'd go take a shower, and by that time I had it at the time. Get it on. Uh, get it on, you know, because it doesn't, the, the thing that you want, because it's a very oily base, is if you know you've been in it, don't just wash with soap. You go to the store, and you get Bell's Napa. It's a lye based soap, and it will cut the oil. And get it off. But like your uh, dove or your palm olive, it's just going to spread. Okay, let's let's go on. Uh, good for proper recovery, helps inhibit the immune system. The uh, thing about the hydrocortisone, or if you give it a prednisone, is it shuts down the adrenals. If you give it uh, pharmacologically, if you take it orally, it shuts down your adrenals. So your husband's on prednisone. How long is he going to be on it? Um, well, he's going lower dosages now. He was at 20 milligrams, so he's yeah. always having to, go, having to do 15 and then 10 yeah. and 5. You can, you can give a single dose up to about 50 milligrams and not have to taper off, but it just you know it cuts out the immune reaction short, you know, quickly, but it isn't there long enough to shut down the adrenals. But if you have something like that, or a really bad case of uh, uh, poison oak or something. You're on, you start at 50 or 100, or you know, say you injured your back, you've got a lot of uh, inflammation in the back. You start, you'll start at 100 milligrams of prednisone, so they're gonna give you a whopping dose. Then they're gonna do 90, then they're gonna do 80, then they're gonna do 70, then they're gonna do 60, 50, 40, 30, 
probably 20, 15, 10, 5, and then you're off. Uh, because what happens is as soon as you give them that 100 milligram dose, it's going to shut down your adrenal. And if you just stop it, then you're, you're, you're stuck without any corticosteroids. So they give the big dose and then they taper it down. And that's, that's, that's why. Uh, stress leads to increased risk of illness. Uh, cortisol may act on the higher brain regions, contribute, contributing to depression and anxiety. Is stress and the cortisol, uh, glucocorticoids stimulate the liver to release glucose. Insulin receptors may become resistant. So you have, you know, we're talking about type 2 diabetes here. You know, type 1 is juvenile diabetes. Your, body, your eyelids of Langerhain are just not, your beta cells are not making insulin. You're on insulin, you know, from a very, very young age. Your type 2 is an increase in insulin resistance. Usually, uh, most of the time, it doesn't get to where you need, uh, you need uh, insulin. You can control it through exercise and diet. But what happens is, if you're in a high-stress job or you're stressing your body in other ways, uh, the insulin receptors become resistant. You become intolerant. And your blood glucose goes up. And what you see is people whose, blood, whose fasting blood sugar normally runs, a normal person would be 70 to 80. And as they get older, as they put on weight, as they're in a more stressful uh, environment, you see this fasting glucose go to 90, to go to 95, to go to 98, to go to 100. And it's not abnormal. Your normal fasting is up to 110, but the American Diabetes Association says anything over 100 is pre-diabetic. So instead of having a normal range, you have a recommended range, and when you start going over 100, your doctor is going to be ordering microalbumin to see if you're starting with kidney damage. He's going to order a glucose tolerance test to see what's going on. He's going to tell you to lose weight, get more exercise, change your diet. Now, uh, there is, you know, and it's finally coming to this, this country, uh, but the gastric bypass surgery. I had a vertical sleeve gastrectomy two years ago. I'm 130 pounds lighter than I was two years ago. My fasting glucose was running about 103. Other than that, I had no core morbidities. No, nothing else was really wrong. I didn't have high blood pressure. I could do, you know, I could get out, I could climb a mountain, I could hike all day. I was okay. The doctor was very surprised because I was walking around at 340 pounds. Um, within a month of surgery, my fasting glucose was down to 70. My liver enzymes were down to uh, in the 20s, which is nor low normal because I was losing the fat off the liver. But it's the fasting glucose, it's the diabetes. It takes the stress off. Uh, the weight loss takes the stress off. And this is the difference between the gastric bypass versus the band versus the vertical sleeve gastrectomy. I had the vertical sleeve because, uh, one, you don't have the malabsorption problems because they don't go past the duodenum. So you have the duodenum, the upper part of the lower of the small intestine. So you can still absorb the calcium and the vitamins and all that. On the other hand, if you look at Europe, one of their treatments for diabetes, for a type 2 diabetes, is a gastric bypass. And if you look at the statistics out of Harvard, 75 to 80 percent of even brittle type 2 diabetics will be non-diabetic by the time they're out of the hospital, which is about three days with a gastric bypass. 
Uh, it is it is utterly amazing. I mean, obviously, it's it's you know you're, you're taking a bunch of the stomach out, you're taking part of the duodenum out, you're doing uh, various uh, junctions, and it's you know you there are risks, but. Uh, for a surgery that would cost you $25,000 out of pocket and probably $75,000 if the insurance paid it for the insurance company versus one hospitalization for three days for kidney problems or amputation of a foot or something for diabetes. I mean, you know, just even the money saving is tremendous, but the ability of a person to live a normal lifestyle and not have problem. these complications. What about the intestine? The problem, like, a friend of my daughter's had it, and she had, like, a real problem with her intestines. They all got all tangled up in there or something, like, years later. Seems to be really careful about what you eat. Well, you have to, yeah, I mean. Five years later or six years later or something, and time she had to have surgery. Uh, you know, you're normally they're not even down in and into the intestines. But what some of them do, uh, I, I, I don't know, I can't address it, because normally they don't go down more than just the upper part of the small intestine. That's not really solving the problem, because I know two persons that had it, and they are starting to gain weight Well, you can, eat, you can eat your way through it. You have to change You can eat your, your way through it. It is not, it is not the end all, yeah. but it's a tool. It's a tool, but you know, if you're willing, if you you know, if you're, if you've got the type two diabetes, and you know, with the type two diabetes, with the insulin, I mean, you're just giving yourself a good chance to get over it. But yeah, you do have to change. And like the doctor said, anybody that can keep their carbohydrates below 40 grams a day, what you still want to do even after the bypass, is not going to have type two diabetes. Because there just isn't enough sugar there to make to have that. So, what is considered low for vaccine resistance? What, what's the normal range? Seventy to one hundred. So, if it's below seventy, what is that? It uh, for fasting, you would look at some sort of hypersecretion of insulin for some reason or another, and then you're going to look at you know, uh, and you know, at sixty-five, nobody's going to worry about it. They're going to say, you know, God bless you. We're talking about sugar. You're talking about sugar. Okay. Low, low fasting glucose. It gets much lower than that. Then the doctor's going to be looking for some hyperglycemia. Like uh, hyperglycemia. Uh, hyperglycemia is the response of too little insulin because the insulin isn't there to take uh, to let the glucose into the cells. How do pregnant people get that? Pregnant people get it because it's called gestational diabetes. Okay, so Hypoglycemia is too much insulin. Too much. Okay. Hyperglycemia occurs in five to ten percent of the pregnant ladies, and it's because you don't have, for some reason, the, the pancreas, the islets of Langerhans, the beta cells cannot produce enough insulin for the mother and the baby. So uh, that's you know, that's your gestational diabetes, and after the baby's born, you should go back to normal. <laughs> I, I wasn't asking a personal question. I thought you were asking a question. Oh, no, no. Okay, thyroid, parathyroid glands. Oh, I wanted to do one more thing on the pituitary and the growth hormone. Um, David and Goliath. You know, little punk David, big Goliath. They now, there are some theories out there that one, if you have too little growth hormone, you get pituitary dwarfism. You're, you don't have the hormone until, you know, you're, what happens is your cartilage ossifies before you, you grow. If you have too much hormone, you get what they call pituitary gigantism. And if you have if that continues into the adult and you have too much growth hormone, uh, once the cartilage is ossified, you don't grow any bigger, but your bones change. And one of the theories, and I've heard it you know, from doctors, I've heard it from uh, archaeologists, 
is if you go back to the biblical, uh, the biblical and Dead Sea Scrolls uh, accounts of David and Goliath. They say, you know, one, the biblical says Goliath was one nine cubits, uh, which would be about almost nine feet tall. Almost ten feet tall. Uh, the other ones, the Dead Sea Scrolls, say that he was about seven feet tall, which, which actually compares to some of the skeletons they found in some of the villages in, those, you know, in that area. But, they figured he probably had uh, gigantism from a pituitary problem. He was big, he was strong, but he was slow. And what happened is essentially David, uh, at least according to this, David was able to, you know, kind of dart back and forth, and he couldn't, Goliath couldn't keep him in the in sight. And so he bounced a stone off his temple, according to the to the story. And that didn't kill Goliath. You know, it's a soft part of the skull, but it didn't kill Goliath. It just knocked him out. Then he walked up and cut his head off. That killed Goliath. Mm -hmm. But is anyway. Way, is that why when you sit on the news, like the world tells people, they're like so awkwardly walking and Yes. Running? Yeah, that's, that's generally like, a pituitary gigantism. They're very strange. They don't get so very awkward. And they usually, you know, they usually don't live out of their mid-20s. So it's not like Henry yeah. yeah. the Giant? Yeah. No, Elton Man is something different. Um, Andrew the Giant lived pretty old. Yeah, he lived, he lived, I think he lived in his 40s. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something like that. But he was, again, to a dairy. Are they like ginormous coming out of the shoe, or what? Uh, the shoe. Well, you know. Yeah. Interesting. I don't, I don't know that they are, because I think a lot of that happens right after birth. So they kind of start out in general. And then they just, they just grow. They the shoe. The shoe. Okay, thyroid, parathyroid glands. Uh, thyroid, just below the larynx in here. Uh, the big thing about thyroid surgery is you don't want to cut the vocal cords. You're broke, somebody's a millionaire. If that happens. Uh, you're very careful when they're dissecting, uh, taking out a thyroid. Uh, you have the cartilage. What's that? So I'm surprised you didn't think your husband happy. <laughs> I'm sure you know that on that part. You know, you know what the Chinese proverb of a perfect marriage is? <laughs> a deaf husband and a blind wife together. <laughs> I would never say that. <laughs> but I'll get away with it here. Thyroid, just below the larynx, in the throat. You have um, hollow spaces called follicles. They're lined with cuboidal epithelium, uh, follicular cells. Interiors are the follicles are filled with a fluid called colloid. Uh, and outside you have the parafollicular cells. Let me see if we've got a... So here, follicles, follicular cells, colloid is in inside. Thyroglobulin is made by the follicular cells. Thyroid follicles accumulate iodine. We talked about last week, if, uh, if you weren't here, Japan. Japan is issuing millions of pills of potassium iodide. Because what they want to do is they want to saturate the thyroid glands with iodine because the radioactive iodine that's getting out of the nuclear plants is getting into the water, the milk, the food chain. And if their thyroids are not saturated with iodine, the thyroid will pick up this radioactive iodine. And then you've just got some, something to cause cancer. You, you have this radioactive focus that's being stored in the body. That's why they're given this potassium iodine. Uh, they accumulate iodine, they secrete it into the colloid, which into the center space here. Iodine is attached to the tyrosines within the thyroglobulin molecule, and when it's attached, you've got a, a monoiodotyrosine, 
or you have a diiodotyrosine. It attaches to the tyrosines, you get two iodines or one iodine. Then, the enzymes within the colloid, within the colloid here, attach the monoiodotyrosine and the diiodo together. And then you have, or then so you have a T4 or a thyroxine or T3. Tetraiodothyronine or triiodothyronine, T3 and T4. They're still bound to thyroglobulin. They disassociate when the thyroid gland is stimulated by TSH and they go out into the bloodstream. We measure T3, T4, uh, generally when we look at somebody that we want to know if, if their thyroid's functioning right, we will measure the TSH level to see that it's there to be stimulated, and then we measure what they call the free T4, the, uh, the T4 that is not bound to thyroglobulin and is floating out in the, and is in the blood plasma. Now, really, your active is your free T3, uh, but we kind of interpolate if you've got enough free T4, you're going to have enough free T3. It's going to release just the T3 into the blood? Releases both of them. Oh. Releases both of them. So here, production of a thyroid hormone. Uh, you have your thyroid taking up iodine with peroxidase, oxidized iodine and plus the thyroglobulin. It then takes the monoiodotyrosine and the diiodotyrosine with the uh, thyroid enzyme making a triiodothyronine or a tetraiodothyronine. Bound by thyroid thyroglobulin here, it's still on the thyroglobulin. Exocytosis stimulated by TSH and it's out in the plasma. And you have the thyroid hormone secretion. Plasma carrier proteins, it's attached to proteins, and they still call them a thyroglobulin, but I think it's more of an albumin base. But anyway, it will be carried to the cell, attached to the protein, released at the cell, and then absorbed by the cell. What the thyroid does is it increases the basic cellular metabolism rate. It causes the cells to be more active. At one point for weight control, they thought about um, giving people thyroid. You know, and, then, you know, and then you're pushing them into a bunch of different hormonal diseases. So that stopped. Thyroid stimulates protein synthesis, uh, promotes the maturation of the nervous system. Now, uh, how many you have kids? How many have kids? Okay, when they, when that child was born, we came down and we poked the heel. Whether you were there to watch us or not, we try not to move the parents around. Because the baby screams like that. So we filled out a bunch of blood, about seven little dots of blood, which we sent off to the state. And they take the little dots of blood, and they elute the blood off of them, and we, uh, we blot it with paper. They elute the blood off. They check, they check for thyroid. They check for various, various other growth hormones, various other, uh, they're looking for various deficiencies in hormones and in chemicals in the blood in a newborn. If you have uh, a child that the thyroid, when they're born, is not working right, you get a syndrome they call cretinism. Yeah. You, know, you have the friendly kid that calls the other kid on the block a cretin. Uh, the nerve cells don't develop, the brain doesn't develop, their IQ is very low, they're, they're what we would call a cretin. What they found is if they see this right at birth, they give the kid exogenous thyroid. And they can do this, and at five years old, there's no difference in the average IQ of one that got one and then got the thyroid, and one that didn't need it. 
so they can preserve the IQ, they can avoid cretinism, and this is why, by law, every baby that's born within 12 hours, we are drawing this and sending it off. And if there's uh, something comes wrong, it goes right back to the pediatrician or back to the clinic. They get the baby in and they get them on and they get them on some sort of supplement. Uh, elevates the cellular respiration. Elevates the basic met metabolic metabolic rate. And it's almost a break. Elevates makes the body work. Makes the cells work. Makes the metabolism turn over. Calcitonin made by the parafollicular cells, inhibits the dissolution of calcium from bone, stimulates excretion of calcium in the kidneys to lower blood calcium levels. If you have too much calcium, calcitonin, as opposed to the parathyroid cells, which we will get to. Iodine deficiency leads to the overstimulation of the thyroid gland. If you don't have the iodine to make the T3 and T4, thyroid gland is going to be overstimulated because you're not going to have it in the system for the negative feedback. So the TRH and the TSH are going to be secreted and they're going to be putting pressure on the thyroid gland to, uh, to make more thyroid. And obviously if you don't have the iodine, you can't. Now, why don't we see that in this country? It's extremely, extremely rare. In the salt. You go to the store, any salt that you're going to buy in the store is iodized. There's iodine in it already. There's an option to not iodize. Why is that? Because you can't shepherd people everywhere. I don't want, I don't want fluoride in my water. I want kids to to fall off. I don't want iodine in my salt. I want to, I want to get a nice big goiter. Uh, because people don't like to be controlled. And, you know, and now this is something that, you know, it just common sense says you need it. Let's make sure you get it and it avoids all these problems. No you don't ways. get too much of it. There's no other ways to get iodine. Well, you can get it. Uh, you can take an iodine tablet. You can take, uh, you know, backpacking we would use iodine to treat water. And if you have some sort of, sort of thyroid problem, then you better not do it that way because it's just going to uh, enhance the problem. <clears throat> but normally you don't see it in this country because you know you buy more than salt or whatever. It's all I does. Uh, hypothyroidism. Uh, we'll show you a picture in a second of a goiter. Uh, low metallic metabolic rates, weight gain, lethargy, poor adaption to cold stress. Again, what did we look at with our mice signals? Uh, you know, it got cold, metabolic, metabolic rate was able to increase to keep the body temperature. Here you can't do it. You have a lot more trouble with cold. Mixed edema, accumulation of fluids in the subcutaneous connective tissues. Here's a goiter. No iodine. Probably, you know, Asia, Indonesia, someplace where, uh, you know, eating very, very naturally, I'm sure, there's just some place where there's no iodine in the water. Parathyroid glands. Um, go back. Where, where can you get iodine? I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, no, I you know I would I would think probably that you it would be uh, it gets into the uh, you know, into the food chain. It's obviously in the food chain because that's what they're worried about in Japan. Uh, so I don't, you know, I don't know exactly how much is in what, but I think your, your green leafy vegetables, things like that, have I have I don't know. But let me check it out. I'll let you know. And no, I'm curious. But where's oh, Matthew left? He was going. He would have. He would have just looked it up on his iPod. He has. Oh, she's working on us. 
We'll get back to you on that. Now, the other thing is if you have too much thyroid. Betty Davis eyes. You get fat, you get it in the sclera, you get the bulging eyes. It's a soil and water naturally. Soil and water naturally. So that's why they get those creepy bulgy eyes that look like... Well, they think Betty Davis had a hyperthyroid, had a thyroid problem. Betty Davis, and she's still like, yeah. No. Betty White. <laughs> Betty White is a kid. Yeah. Betty White is a kid. For a little old lady, she's a kid. Okay, parathyroid glands. Small gland, back of the thyroid. Um, very small. It secretes a parathyroid hormone. The only thing a parathyroid hormone does, it's the main regulator of the calcium. And regular, regular calcium. It uh, promotes a rise in calcium by acting on bones, kidneys, and intestine. If you've got parathyroid and you don't have enough calcium, it's going to take it out of the bones. Your bones are a big storage area in the body for calcium. Uh, your, when we get into the, the skeletal muscle, when we get into muscle contraction, you obviously need calcium. Cardiac muscle contraction. You need calcium. You don't have enough calcium. You're you're in. You've got big problems. Not only with muscle contraction, but also calcium is very important in the coagulation pathways. You need calcium to have your blood clot. When we would give somebody. Um, well, acid, citric, dextrose. When we would give somebody a lot of blood, I mean, you're talking twice their body capacity. So you're like looking at 12, 15, 20 units of blood. What you see is because calcium is being bound up by the anticoagulant, that the calcium levels go down. And then all of a sudden you see the EKG starting to go funny because it doesn't have the calcium there for muscle contractions. And so the anesthesiologist, uh, not in the line that the blood's going in, because it would cause it to clot right there, will give, them, uh, will give them calcium. Usually by the time your blood gets so low that uh, you won't clot for the lack of calcium, you're dead, out. you're dead before that. You die before that. But it's still, uh, it's important in muscle contraction. It's important in... Uh, in coagulation. If it can't get it, the parathyroid is going to take it from the bones and you get it what they call osteoporosis. Now on that, again, now you're getting back into, the, again, the vitamin D, which is the test of fat right now. I, you know, five years ago I didn't do 20 vitamin Ds a year. Now I do 250 a month because it has been implicated in so many different uh, disease states from osteoporosis to uh, heart problems to the various other things. But don't you just have to walk 30 minutes outside a day and you're good? Yeah, but how many Yeah, but you don't use sunblock. Yeah. Sunblock, with sunblock, you don't get the vitamin D. You, know, you get it like right on your hands. But sunscreen like, is Maybe so. But what they do is they normally want you to start, you know, taking it. You can take vitamin D and get it. Uh, or you can go out and take a walk in the sun, which is probably better for you all the way around. But now, you know, and then the last article I picked up a few days ago talks about problems with vitamin D and calcium, calcium supplements at the same time causing problems. So eat well, get out in the sun, get some exercise, Parathyroid uh, controls calcium metabolism, calcium uptake. Pancreas and other endocrine glands. Pancreas, uh, endocrine and exocrine. Endocrine goes into the blood system. Exocrine goes into a duct, into the intestine. Endocrine cells are the alpha cells that produce glucagon. The beta cells that produce insulin. The alpha cells uh, and beta cells are antagonistic. One stores glucose, one breaks it down. 
The glucagon causes the release of glucose into the blood system. The insulin causes the uptake of, uh, of glucose into the cells and the formation of glycogen and the fat and all that. Pancreas. Now the pancreas, and this is you know this is nice out in the open, but the pancreas is way, way in the back. It's behind the small intestine, the upper loop of the small intestine, way in the very posterior portion of the of the abdominal cavity, which which when they have something like a pancreatic cancer. It's nothing that they pick up very easy because you can't see it very easy. You can't, you know, if a doctor's in doing an appendectomy, he'll take a look around in there and see if there's anything else going on. But if you're in for an appendectomy down here and you're trying to get kind of behind the liver and behind the intestine to see the pancreas, uh, it just doesn't happen. And that's why pancreatic cancer is so extremely deadly. Uh, a five-year survival rate for pancreatic cancer is about 2%. Because you don't find it. Are there not symptoms? Either? Well, there will be symptoms, but by the time there's symptoms, it's too late. Uh, and... Uh, is there a yep, for not, not for that, not yet. So it's not terrible. Oh, no. What, what they do for a pancreatic cancer is a procedure they call a Whipple. And they take the pancreas and the gallbladder and the upper part of the intestine, and they take down there everything you can live without up there. And uh, the, first, God, the first 20 years I was in medicine, I don't think I ever saw anybody get out of the hospital after a Whipple. Obviously, some people must have because, uh, because they kept doing it. But now, now I see people coming out of, of the hospital regularly after Whipples, but again, their long-term survival rate is extremely poor, and their life is miserable. Because they have to take they, so They've got to take the insulin, they've got to take the bile, they don't have bile, they don't have insulin, they don't have glucagon. They don't have any of them. You have made them an extremely brittle diabetic. You know, and uh, you know, most of them are going to be dead in five years. But you know, you grasp, and I don't argue this. You grasp that, you know, a couple of years with the family. You grasp, you grasp. Yeah, but, you know, that's that's how it's nasty. It's very nasty. I hope I'm not scaring you out there. Okay. Oh yeah, one of us in this class. He's been traumatized for the rest of his life. Insulin secreted by the beta cells. Uh, glucose rises after a sugary meal. You have receptors in the intestine that, that say, hey, I've got a bunch of glucose coming through. You have stretch receptors saying, I've got food coming into the intestine out of the stomach. The body's going to secrete insulin, getting ready for all that nice sugar that's coming in. It lowers blood sugar levels to the normal range. Its purpose isn't to lower blood sugar because it doesn't know that it's doing that. Its purpose is to get the blood sugar into the cells, into the liver where it can be stored. This kind of acts like it's you know, got a conscious effect, which obviously isn't there. But it gets blood in glucose, it gets the glucose into the cells where it can be used or stored. In the cell that's stored as glycogen, it's stored as fat, uh, it's stored as ATP to a certain extent, but your body doesn't store a lot of ATP. It goes through the Krebs cycle when there's enough ATP in the cells, and then it starts forming glycogen and then starts forming fat, depending on the cell. Uh, binds receptors. This is what we talked about a little bit earlier. It binds receptors on target cells. The vesicles with GLUT4 carrier proteins bind to the membrane. When we went back to that epinephrine, the first slide we showed right at the beginning, epinephrine in the liver, the alpha channel and the beta channel, it caused, what it caused in the long run is GLUT4 channels to get into, uh, into the membrane and let glucose into the cells. 
But other than that, the gluten four proteins are simply floating around in the cytoplasm. Uh, occurs in adipose tissue, skeletal muscle. Uh, you know, part of the epinephrine action on the skeletal muscle is get as much glucose into the skeletal muscle so that when you need it for the muscle activities, the fight or flight syndrome, you've got it there. You've got the energy there. Into the liver. Very common to get it into the liver because that liver stores a tremendous amount of glucose. It's glycogen. And fat. It's glycogen. And then, uh, what does it do in there? Since we're getting ready for the test, uh, there's kinases in there that do what to the glucose so that it doesn't drift back up? Phosphorylase. Phosphorylase. Phosphorylation keeps the glucose in the liver. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't diffuse back out. You take the phosphorus off, you dephosphorylate it, and it can diffuse back out into the bloodstream, and that's what happens when you need blood, or when you need, excuse me, when you need glucose. The glucose is dephosphorylated, it comes out of the liver, it gets into the bloodstream, it goes to where it needs to go. Uh, I think we've seen this one before. Here's your GLUT4 proteins. There, they get to the, uh, they get embedded in the cell membrane and they allow glucose in, as long as the insulin is available to cause that reaction. Uh, indirectly stimulates the enzyme glycogen synthesis uh, in liver skeletal muscles to promote sugar storage. Stimulate in the adipose tissue, you don't store the sugar, it causes it to form fat. Glucagon, like I told you, this is an antagonistic reaction. Antagonistic insulin secreted by the alpha cells, not the beta cells. Its purpose is to raise the glucose to the normal range. Stimulates the liver to hydrolyze glucagon into glucose, release it into the body. Stimulates gluconeogenesis, the conversion of non-carbohydrates, proteins, amino acids. Uh, stimulates lipolysis, turning fat into glucose. Homeostasis, uh, I think we've probably got that. High glucose, high insulin, low glucose, high glucogen. High neogland, located in the third ventricle of the brain. We talked about the pineal gland before. It secretes melanin. Yeah. We're almost done here. Let me, let me have a couple of minutes and I'll be done with this chapter. And, and then I'll join you. <laughs> uh, secretes melatonin, regulated by the hypothalamus and the suprachiasmic nucleus, or the hypothalamus. Stimulates melatonin production when it gets dark. Right now, your melatonin is starting to go up. It starts to relax you. It starts to get you ready to go to sleep. I mean, you get to the agrarian... Uh, or you get me out on a camp out after a couple of days, you know, as soon as it starts to get dark, I'm ready for that. Uh, they have problems, actually. They have problems. They have to force themselves to sleep. They take melatonin pills. Uh, you know, when you get that far north and you're, you have light for 22 hours a day, uh, your rhythms get, get all off. And then, conversely, they have darkness, you know, for 24 hours a day in the winter. So there, it's, it's a lot tougher up there. So you have daylight. Daylight inhibits. Daylight, the light coming through the rods and cones through the retina, inhibits the formation of melatonin. At night, it stimulated uh, the RAS system, the reticular activation system that we talked about in Chapter 7, I believe, which means it will probably be on the test. Uh, talks about the control of this. Test. You know there's a test coming. April 12th. Okay. In the intestinal tract, there's hormones that cause the secretion uh, for the digestive process. Gastrin. You know, your gastric acid. 
is secreted, a hormone acts on it for the secretion in the stomach. Uh, your gonads, your sex organs produce testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. These we will get into, these are just kind of introductions, we will get into it when we get the digestive system, when we hit the reproductive system. Autocrine and paracrine, now those are, should be some firmer terms we're familiar with. Autocrine, the hormone is secreted, and what does it act on? Auto, self, it acts on the self, then on the cells that make it. Paracrine acts on the cells right around where the hormone is produced, as opposed to exocrine or endocrine. There's your four types, autocrine, paracrine, exocrine, and endocrine. Short-range signaling between neighbor cells, uh, the sender, the hormone, and the cell that it's working on are the same cell type. It's right there. Paracrine, uh, sender and receiver can be different types of cells or tissues. But it's not going into the blood system. It's not going into a duct. It's excreted and it works on the cells right around it, or it works on itself. Uh, many regulatory molecule, molecules, cytokines are growth factors. Um, lymphokines, they work on the lymphocytes, neurotropins, work on the white cells. Gene expression is in the target cell, it's working on itself. Again, it's autocrine. We'll get that into that. Uh, this is in your book. Prostaglandins. I think that's just about it. Hang on one second. Yeah, okay. Just a couple of prostaglandins. We'll hit prostaglandins and we'll let you out here for a while. Prostaglandins. Arachidonic acid made from arachidonic acid. Um, they function, they have various functions on all the different cells. Uh, here, it's from the arachidonic acid, you have the leukotrains. They cause inflammation, they cause bronchioconstriction, they cause vasoconstriction, they cause capillary permeability. General, these are not really good things to have happen to you. You can't breathe, you're bleeding. And uh, you can't get blood anywhere. And it's inflammation, it hurts. Uh, this is the leukotrienes, the prostaglandin 1, the antiplatelet aggregation, vasodilation, prostaglandin 2, smooth muscle relaxation, vasodilation, prostaglandin 2A, smooth muscle contraction, vasoconstriction, uh, A2, uh, platelet aggregation and vasoconstriction. You have prostaglandins that work uh, antagonistically. This is why your platelets are able to plug a clot when you get a cut, but they're not clotting and plugging every capillary and artery they go through because you've got prostaglandins there that keep that from happening. Again, it's a balance. And like all those other systems in the body, insulin, glucagon, uh, you know, you have all these antagonistic systems. You get a much finer control of the process when you have that. Now, immune system. Prostaglandins in pro, uh, promote inflammation. Anybody, I mean, everybody here has been stung by a bee, right? Have you ever been stung by a bee? God, you ought to try it sometime. No, I'm not very good. Okay. So you keep uh, syringe? You have an effort? Yeah. Bee stings are a prostaglandin-mediated result or effect. It's the inflammation from the prostaglandin that makes it swell up and hurt like hell. It, there are drugs that inhibit prostaglandin re uh, responses. But let's get through this. Reproductive... I'm sorry, what makes that, that for someone 
look at it be much more painful and much more swollen than for someone else? Uh, sometimes it's, a, it's an allergic reaction. It's an histamine-based reaction, not a prostaglandin based. But some of them are just more sensitive. I mean, I used to swell up badly, but I've been stung so many times that I hardly hardly affects them anymore. Uh, reproductive system, it aids in ovulation, good thing. Digestive system, inhibits secretion, stimulates propulsion and absorption, which is, you know, it's a good thing. Respiratory system, aids in bronchial constriction. I'm not sure which one does dilation, but the bronchial constriction is asthma. They figure asthma is a prostaglandin-related problem. Functions of prostaglandin, it affects vasoconstriction, dilation, and blood clotting. It's a antagonistic. You look at the different prostaglandins, one affects uh, platelet aggregation, one inhibits platelet aggregation. Increases blood flow to the kidneys, uh, increased excretion of urine. Uh, here we go. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, NSAIDs. Prohibit prostaglandin synthesis by inhibiting the, ex, uh, the enzyme cyclooxygenase. oxygenase. Almost done. Uh, side effects include gastric bleeding, kidney problems, less clotting. You take aspirin. You take 80 milligrams of aspirin a day because it, it interferes with the platelet function. You take too much aspirin, you know, in the late 1800s when aspirin came out, everybody started developing ulcers. Because, hell, aspirin made you feel good. It's the first analgesic they had. Aspirin inhibits the, the secretion, the prostaglandin secretion of mucus in the stomach. So the acid can eat through and you get ulcers. The thing is, people say, well, take the aspirin with a buffer. Well, you can take an aspirin suppository and still get ulcers. Because it's not the buffer, it's not the direct action on the stomach, it's the action on the prostaglandins. Um, you know, let's go. This is only a couple of minutes, we'll get it when we come back. I'm going to take a break. What's that? How long do you like we're going to go? Well, I'm going to... No, not we're going to at least get partway through chapter 12 tonight. What's that? You first, that way we don't mix them up. I'm very easily confused. Well, chapter mill is 12 is muscle contraction, so you shouldn't have to do it. Okay?